So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Bob Adams. I'm one of the lead security engineers for iSecure. And uh, we've been talking a lot about risk today uh, in various forms. Uh, I offer a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and I spend a lot of my time in the trenches. I do a lot of compliance and audits. And there's some observations that I see that um, are, are starting to become uh, much more commonplace and uh, seem to be a common theme across a lot of different organizations. So today's goals, understanding your risk accurately, how to reset to some extent your risk posture, what risk assessments you should, should expose, and simple controls can make a difference. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, who in the audience right now works in uh, security and uh, security ops? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Uh, IT application engineer? Okay. Uh, anybody that actually does pure risk and compliance or governance? Okay. And do we have any C level or executive stakeholders in the audience that uh, would be uh, managing those particular groups as well? Great. Uh, so let's talk about your risk appetite, risk management, um, assessments, and where you stand. Uh, the biggest risk that you have is not knowing where your risk resides. I mean, the, the huge issue that I see is that people are oblivious to certain aspects of their security maturity and their risk posture. And they uh, find it very difficult to understand what they need to do in order to narrow that gap or harden their environment. The thing that probably makes IT and security folks uh, crazy is the fact that the fundamental activities that organizations do to grow are actually ones that contribute the greatest to their risk. That could be globalization, mergers, uh, extension of third party networks and acquisitions, uh, outsourcing critical business activities, adoption of new technologies, uh, moving to the cloud, mobility, all those things contribute to your risk posture. Let's face it, everything you do has risks surrounding it. You get up in the morning, you drive to work, there's a certain amount of inherent risk that comes to uh, being in traffic, driving your car. You're, if you have a large risk appetite, you probably play in the stock market. You do things that um, you know have risk, but your appetite is sufficient enough that you feel that the uh, potential rewards are great. There are people out there who um, feel that they want to push the boundaries of risk, and they're not really quite sure what they're going to do. This is what ends up happening. <laughs> uh, people in IT, SIS admins, people that are on the ground floor, they struggle with this every day. They have huge user groups that have uh, user permissions, uh, their active directory controls, their group policy are all there to uh, control and provide that segmentation so that the least privilege model is being employed and that they have some modicum of control um, over their uh, environment. The thing that they fear most is going to be this guy. Uh, everybody worries about being hacked, but in actuality, it's not going to be a guy that looks like that. It's going to be more somebody that looks like this. Um, they're usually um, relatively unstructured, unless it's a government or political threat actor. Um, they're the ones that are going to bring huge amounts of resources to bear, and they're the ones that um, are usually the most successful at what they do. Now I'm going to jump to a different part of risk. Take, for instance, this guy, Jeffrey Wong, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's Operations Officer. If you remember, uh, about two years ago, Jeffrey was uh, interviewed by one of the national TV uh, uh, organizations and performed an interview as the uh, Operations Officer. About a year later, with the uh, threat from North Korea, they actually re implemented the early morning uh, service uh, on the Hawaiian Islands. A few days later, one of the employees, not Jeffrey, uh, actually hit the wrong button and initiated the system and scared an enormous number of people into thinking that the world was coming to an end. So for, for Jeffrey, it wasn't the risk of being on TV, it was actually that he was targeted as the individual. Uh, who was responsible for that activity. So he had a media relations problem that actually got very personal for him. But one of the big things 
to the herd was he suffered some uh, subordinate risk uh, just because of the fact that he was on TV. And in the next slide, you're going to understand why. Can anybody tell me what's going on in the slide that is potentially a security risk? Anyone? Excellent. It's right there. Uh, he actually had functioning passwords on post-it notes uh, on, the, on the monitors or the all-in-ones that they were running in the operations center. So, definition of a threat. A threat is something that is going to do harm to your organization um, or a system within your organization. Examples, natural threats, unintentional threats. That could be a poorly trained employee. Uh, it could be a hardware failure that has causing uh, you know, some sort of uh, inappropriate activity or uh, poor patching. Um, intentional threats or threat actors. So government, uh, you have uh, you know, political activists, you have uh, hacktivists or script kiddies. Um, you have people that have you know, very specific agendas. And one that we've been talking about a lot today has been uh, poorly vetted third parties um, or service providers. What is a vulnerability? It refers to a known weakness of an asset that can be exploited by one or more different means of attack. Um, people are going to take that uh, risk and that vulnerability and they're going to start to figure out uh, what's going to be the easiest way to compromise your system. So there's a couple of different ways that it can be modeled. Risk is threats times vulnerabilities, and the magnitude can be the likelihood versus the consequence. So um, people need to think about uh, where their chief risk or threat relies or resides within their organization. Ways that organizations manage risk. And this is where um, sometimes I get very frustrated because uh, I'll go into an organization and the things that I would expect for them to have, policies and procedures, documentation, uh, may be non-existent, may be very immature, um, or, or tribal in nature. Uh, simply that something that's been handed over from one sysadmin, engineer, architect to another, and really hasn't had any hard documentation uh, placed uh, within that, that requirement. So here's my assumption when I go in. Perception, analysis, and management. Um, it happens more frequently than you expect. Um, people think that they have you know, a huge amount of risk. They do this quick analysis and say it'll never happen to me, and then they wait for it to happen. Worst case scenario. This is where um, I see a lot of organizations fall flat. Um, they don't do any sort of risk analysis. They don't understand where their security posture is. And in doing so, they have fundamentally said, I don't have anything that's worth destroying or compromising. And so they're going to take a security gut punch. They're going to be the organization that gets hacked, breached, uh, has some sort of data exfiltration, um, and they are never going to be able to recover because the loss uh, has been way too high. Classic question. We've we've touched on this several times today. You know, what what are you doing for network security? I got a firewall. Really? I mean, that's all you're doing. That's what ends up being a very common uh, response, especially in small organizations who unfortunately need the same amount of uh, skill, uh, risk management, vulnerability assessment, and compliance as any large organization to stay in business. The problem that I see is that there isn't enough training and visibility for the security and risk management uh, that's conveyed, that risk conveyed accurately from the people who are in the trenches to people that would be in a uh, decision-making role, whether it be a small organization with just one or two tiers um, or a company that's growing exponentially and they really haven't come up with a mature process to control um, their risk and their liabilities. Security, nobody wants to spend money on security until they've been breached and then they're all in. Uh, my comments to that is, do you want to pay the 3.1 point, 
one seven million dollar fine or spend 50 grand on you know some reasonably good security controls that are going to make uh, your uh, environment a little bit more robust you know making sure that you have the appropriate cybersecurity and liability insurance in place have you actually done a realistic calculation of what um, your total liability would be from a dollar amount um, one of the things that I'm starting to see is that the calculations for the liability and the cybersecurity, I think, are low. I think that as we move forward over the next couple of years, the cost to recover is going to be much greater. And I encourage people to actually view um, and look at how that calculation is made and what they need to do in order to improve it uh, and make sure that they're resilient enough to survive some sort of data breach or ransomware or whatever. I, I keep reminding people that security is not just a once a year event. It's a continuous process. You're going to assess, remediate, monitor, and repeat. It's sort of you know, the uh, wear, wash, rinse, repeat model. Uh, but for cybersecurity, um, you should have tools and resources in place that are going to provide the visibility that you need um, and are going to provide you with the necessary intelligence to make quality decisions on what your organization uh, has as far as security um, and, and what activity is going on inside of it. So here's a great example. Uh, has anybody actually uh, looked at some of the, the uh, information that is filtered out on the Deutsche Bank? Um, uh, it's not really a leak, but it's a breakdown of the process. So Deutsche Bank uh, has been suffering a lot of uh, fiscal downturn. Um, they are expected to have a $3.8 billion charge off this year. Um, they're expected over the next couple of business years to reduce their workforce by 19,000 people. Um, they have started to do the um, reduction in workforce. They started with about 900 people in a couple of different uh, uh, organizational branches. And these 50 particular employees were terminated, uh, but no order was given to actually shut their accounts off and control their access uh, to specific resources within Deutsche Bank. 50 traders in London and New York um, had free access to the email system. Uh, one individual actually felt that uh, they could continue using it for uh, their own personal use, and it sent about 450 messages. Um, what I find incredible is that there was a breakdown in process where the termination of those employees did not trigger uh, the appropriate uh, activities to shut those accounts off, delete them, or do whatever it would be a normal process. Um, you know, that is, that is something that from a um, audit perspective, a compliance perspective, that would be, I would consider, I would fail. <laughs> Um, this one we just started to uh, touch on, uh, Paige Thompson. Uh, she was a uh, software engineer that worked uh, for either a subsidiary or for uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, was able to find a uh, it poorly configured or misconfigured web application firewall and uh, was able to exploit it and exfiltrated about 110 million records, which uh, is substantial. But the things that sort of bothered me about the whole process was that there were several uh, uh, reporting agencies that stated, yeah, they have great security, they do a good job, they have a, a high level of maturity, they have all of the appropriate um, uh, resources in place to prevent this from happening. So my question is, and I did sort of a mental postmortem, uh, where was the firewall and audit and the pen test that would have exposed potentially uh, this misconfigured application firewall? Um, where were the alerts about the literally terabytes of data that were being exfiltrated over a very short period of time? It looks like it was only one or two days. Um, and that there was a very distinct uh, data flow traffic pattern taking place with a source and target IP. And the most important question, uh, because I deal with this in HIPAA compliance all the time, is why do they need 110 million records online and available for a 15-year period? Um, do they not have a process 
to archive or control the amount of data that they use in their live data set. Um, those things become uh, questions that would have been part of uh, you know, a compliance analysis or a process analysis where we would say, well, maybe we only need 20 million and reduce their liability substantially. The big problem, and we've touched on this before, is the reputational aspect. Cap one, their stock has already started to uh, see some changes in its valuation. They've also stated that even though the data they believe was not compromised or distributed, it's still going to cost them between 100 and 150 million dollars um, to overcome this particular uh, data breach or event. So we've talked that doing nothing is really not the solution. Um, and I propose to you that a slightly better solution is not really any better at all. You know, you do a internal audit, it's a, I call it a light. Um, you don't have a lot of endorsement or commitment by um, senior IT, C-level executive stakeholders, uh, depending on the size of the organization. And what ends up is if you do a somewhat truncated audit, um, or uh, vulnerability assessment, and you present that information with uh, pretty colored charts, um, or you quantify it um, you know, with numbers, but don't really provide any sort of rubric to give you a equivalency or score. Um, this, for some people, promotes a false sense of security. Great, we've had a security audit, and now we're good, and we don't need to do this again for X number of months or perhaps a year, uh, keeping in mind that this should be a continuous process. Does this really make the uh, decision-making process better? Um, I, I don't think it does, because it really is um, giving a false sense of security, and even if you present to the executive team, the C-level staff, and they're all nodding their heads, um, you, you have imparted a false sense of security, and, and, and you really don't know if they understand what's being presented to them. One of the things that we struggle with uh, in the compliance and security arena is how do you deliver that information in an appropriate way so that the folks that are ultimately going to make the dollar and cent solutions uh, can understand it, uh, giving them some sort of equivalency or metric uh, by which to make a good you know, decision. Um, you know, this is probably one of the most tragic uh, occurrences, is grading it with colors. Um, it really doesn't mean a lot. The, the problem is that people continue to foster that. They don't provide any sort of equivalency uh, metric or understanding of what the true data is that they're providing. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is that because of that false sense of security, the uh, decision makers can make a bad decision even faster. They don't, there isn't enough corroborating evidence to support the overall process. Making the right choice, commitment, understanding, uh, along with technical and fiscal uh, support. I call those critical success factors. And in a lot of the executive summaries that we provide, um, you'll see um, that it's broken out into three components. You have the um, technical component, you have a fiscal component, and you have a staffing component. And they all need to align uh, you know, in an even or appropriate balance so that, that particular uh, milestone or project can be completed, um, or the appropriate project management um, path can be attained. Take the right steps. This is where it gets fun. First thing, how many people here actually use the compliance framework? Is it NIST? Um, ISO, um, uh, PCI, DSS, let's see a show of hands. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, by adopting a compliance framework, and I'm not saying that it's the panacea uh, for all of your security bills, but at least it provides you with a foundational groundwork by which to uh, gauge uh, and understand the very distinct areas that you may need uh, compliance or improve your security posture. So passwords, endpoint, we talk about this all the time. Um, you know, anything that has to do with um, accessibility, uh, how you control fiscal egress uh, into your facility, 
um, how you vet your, uh, your, your vendors. Um, all of these uh, can be identified and um, illustrated within a policy and, and a compliance framework that you are generating for your organization. Unfortunately, a lot of people will do um, a cultural um, process, make it very tribal. Uh, they, until you put it into hard documentation, it has no bite. So compliance frameworks to consider. Obviously, this, the NIST cybersecurity framework, the SANS 20, PCI DSS, NYS DFS, uh, FFIDC for those folks in the financial arena, COVID, ISO 27000, HIPAA, FISMA, SOC 2, FEDERAN, all of those, depending on the market vertical that you're in, would be appropriate choices. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> um, the one big area that we are all going to struggle with is the human error. And you can put um, all of the hardware, all the software tools, until you get past Dave, we have a problem. You can reduce the potential for risk by creating and implementing a risk management plan. Key aspects to consider, no more security band-aids. Don't add any more security solutions and services. Forget about adding cool security equipment. Get rid of the blinky lights. Start with a well-defined third-party risk assessment. Even if you are um, a large organization and you outsource a lot of your managed services, and your managed service provider says, yeah, we can do a security audit for you, that's really not an accurate checks and balances. I would wholeheartedly recommend you know, that you get a third-party auditor to provide you with an uh, unbiased uh, an accurate assessment of how your organization is doing, even if you have a managed service provider in place. Perform a risk assessment. Make sure that the technical requirements are balanced against the organization's business processes and methodologies. Um, obviously, if you are in a uh, HIPAA environment, there's going to be specific evidence, emphasis on protecting your EPHI uh, and all of the core infrastructure that um, would be appropriate uh, for that particular data set. One of the big things that I see missing a lot is assessing the staff skills and their training. Um, there's a lot of people out there that um, are doing a lot with very little. And by having the appropriate levels of training and uh, staff investment, you actually build a better culture within your organization. Step one, identify the risk. Um, you, you, can't, you can't fix unless you know what it is that you are having a problem with. Two, analyze the risk. Figure out, you know, is that really going to be a huge problem, the likelihood and consequence of that particular risk manifesting itself inside of your organization. Three, evaluate or rank the risk. You know, come up with some sort of uh, scoring uh, rubric for your organization. You know, is this going to really be um, a huge issue for us? And step four, before we get that, um, I put this in this morning. Um, I'm sure you've seen this. We've narrowed the security risk down to two groups. Uh, everyone who works here and everyone who doesn't. Um, and that's very common. I mean, it's sort of adversarial. Um, so um, it, it's something that um, I see a lot of culture where you know we will allow everybody to have access access inside, uh, but those folks outside have zero, um, and it's still a risk because your employees, internal customers, are actually your greatest risk. So step four: treat the risk. Um, this would be part of your risk response planning. Uh, figure out what the highest risks are going to be, rank them, and then come out with some sort of OAM or plan of action that is going to allow you to uh, work through those risks uh, and achieve access access accessible, acceptable risk levels. Monitor and review. Don't stop. You know, you're going to have to constantly re -entry, go through and make sure that um, those risks uh, aren't changing in front of you. So if you have a specific endpoint protection in place, but it's not offering um, the appropriate level of security or there's a specific specific emphasis that you need uh, data leakage uh, or PHI at an endpoint. Maybe you want to uh, consider a different solution. Um, now, once you've completed those, start to work with your IT and security team or partners on how to refine and remediate those processes so that you can continue to, continue to improve your security posture. Um, 
One of the things that you know, I see time and time again is making sure that you've got the appropriate uh, controls for your user group uh, and users in your Active Directory. Just making some simple controls, and Chip alluded to that, um, you know, only allowing people to have access to uh, human resource information between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. There's no reason that they should have access uh, at any other time. So some of the simple things that uh, uh, are very effective, password, passwords, uh, uh, strong password controls, uh, the policies and procedures, uh, without those being published, uh, without those being developed, you're not going to have the uh, position to uh, improve your security organizations uh, and, and the overall um, uh, you know, posture of the environment. Uh, Multi-part authentication, I'm starting to see more and more of this, uh, even in uh, difficult to manage environments, multi-part seems to take uh, a, a lot of the uh, pressure off. Uh, user, group, least privilege model, don't give them what they don't need. Uh, the consistent pat patching process, we've all seen through uh, Chris's environment that it can be an Achilles seal, but I highly recommend that you keep up with your patching environment. Uh, effective use of logging and alerts, um, that's going to be something that um, even if you don't have a SIM, understanding what specific uh, activities are within your AD logging, your SIS logs, um, all of those are going to be able to provide you with uh, some tangible uh, activities and action items that you can, you can work with. And most importantly, staff training. Um, being able to provide them with the appropriate skill sets to do their job. Uh, that buying from the corporate side improves the uh, employee um, uh, satisfaction, and um, it also uh, gives them the opportunity to uh, develop new skills and keep them challenged. And the last thing, 80% uh, of corporate data breaches are due to weak passwords and poor patching practices. Um, you know, those are the core issues that we see uh, day in and day out. Um, one study found 92% of the U.S. adults engaged in risky data behavior. 82% reuse passwords. I know everybody does it. 60% use that same password on 50% of your accounts. And 22% use the same password all the time. And a lot of people knew that that was wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I know that I ran over. Um, I